Father, we thank you for this other session you're granting us to, to learn, to share together. We pray that you will enlighten, oh God, the eyes of our understanding. That everything we do here will not just be mere discussion, oh God, but it will be truths that will change our lives for the better. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for ministering to us and for even granting utterance through everything that will be discussed here, the examples we will take and what each and every one of God is going to contribute. May it, oh God, come to edify and bless someone in this place. That at the end of the day, oh Father, the objective for this will be achieved. I pray even for those who are still on the way that you hasten their footsteps. And I will God, this session will be glorious in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Um, rapidly, maybe in two, three minutes, who can remember what we did in the first session? Nobody. Or none of these people were here. It's a really different crowd. Yes, Lorraine. Good evening, everyone. We saw what a vision is and how to establish smart goals or smart objectives in order to uh, implement that vision. Okay. That is a pretty good summary. Spoke about was like an introduction, okay? About who is a leader, what is a vision, establishing goals. And we said a vision is simply a, a mental picture, a clear mental picture of how you see yourself. And between the vision and the implementation, there's a whole process going on, which starts by implementing goals. I was talking about smart goals, right? Goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. And we had some practical examples here. Okay. Um, today is also going to be a kind of complementary lesson. I would call it a bit still introductory. Um, because it's, I consider that we are still in the generalities of, um, of our training. And I think after today, we may go into more practical things like how to do things within the context of a DCG proper. But I think it's, it's important to first of all lay, establish a kind of foundation for leadership. Okay? Because it's not just for a DCG that you're a leader, you're a leader even to impact your world out there. Amen? So today we'll, um, in a few slides, we'll look at um, the profile of a godly leader. And I think it's important that we talk about this because we're not just training leaders. Amen? If it's just about leadership, I mean, there are leadership schools, there are masters in this administration, there are leadership courses out there. But the cry of our heart here in World Changes is to raise a generation of godly leaders, people who do things in a way that God will be glorified, even as the man of God was praying here. Amen. That our leadership would inspire others. It would show God to the world. So um, we're going to adopt this plan, godly leadership. We're going to talk about what it is. The importance of character, character of a godly leader, how to achieve self-discipline, because that's the litmus test for godly leadership. And then we're going to have a conclusion. So as I earlier mentioned, godly leadership is simply leading in a way that will glorify God. In other words, leading by the principles of the Bible. We don't just want you to lead. We don't just want you to to be in authority and, you know, have a position and, and do things and work with people and, you know, give instructions. No, we want you to do things with the principles or with the concepts established by God himself. And throughout the Bible, when you read the model of leadership, which is laid out in the Bible, it is a servanthood model. Okay, it's kind of a paradox because most people think, a leader is supposed to be on top. And others, you know, are the chindas and everybody comes and, and serves him and supplies things to him. But in the Bible, we learn that a leader is defined by his service. The focus is not on you as an individual. What can I do for myself? 
Okay, the leadership crisis we have in many places in this nation is that somebody is putting authority. The one question he has is, mon vent, qu'est-ce que je mange dedans? Okay, and that is not a godly attitude. The biblical model of leadership is, how can I serve others? How can I be of service? Because without others, there's no leadership. Amen. And I like the next point. Godly leadership aligns with society norms. In other words, asking you to serve in a godly way or to lead in a godly way, we are not asking you to go break the law. Okay? We are not asking you to do some things that are forbidden or to cross some lines. Because all what will be required of you is perfectly in line with what is already ordained or, how can I say, established by the society. Okay, among the scriptures down there, you can see the last one, Galatians 5, 22-23. It's a fair verse, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Hmm? But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fidelity, perseverance, and self-control. The next verse says that, what verse 23 says, against this, there is no law. So, living by the godly standards, led by the Spirit of God, you're not going against any law. You're not committing any crime. Right? So you should not be afraid. You should not be like, Man, this church, this, this thing that I see in church, like, this thing that I see in the Bible, like, uh, maybe, maybe it's... No. People even want to make you feel like you're doing wrong, but against such, there's no law. Who would ever punish you for being gentle? Or is it a crime for exercising patience? So godly leadership already aligns with the society. Okay? Now, the, the, the world wants and needs these godly leaders. Okay? But very few people are willing to pay the price because it doesn't just happen. The second verse, the Romans 8, verse 19, says that word, that creation awaits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Right? And then it says, because creation is subjected to bondage, not by itself. In other words, people are in situations they don't even want to be. They just find themselves there and they are waiting for godly leaders to come and set them free, to deliver them from that situation. Okay? And, and it won't happen by chance. That's why we are doing training about it. That's why we are teaching you. That's why we are edifying ourselves because it's a process. It is learned. Okay? And I hope that by the end of, of the lecture, we'll be willing to start paying the price to at least initiate the process to become godly leaders. The other verse you can go and read in the house, Luke 22, talks about, okay, Jesus was telling his disciples that the greatest of you has to be a servant to the others. Now, you can't talk about good leadership without mentioning character. The character is like uh, the basics. It's like the litmus test. You know litmus test now? Blue is alkaline. Red is acid. That one, there's no middle ground. Either you're blue or you're red, right? So the litmus test to to kind of assess whether this leadership is godly, character is a major player in that assessment. And why is it important that we mention this? Because character is what gives substance, it what gives credibility to your leadership. You can be appointed, you can get to leadership by some other means, okay? But what's going to keep you there and what's going to grow your influence is your character. What's going to sustain you in that position? Not just as a positional leader because you are appointed, but what will cause people to rally with you? It begins with character. Throughout the Bible, I mean, at times, I just, just for fun, I go through the Bible, not reading all the books, I mean, just looking at some characters, and realize that some of the people who end up failing it is because of character flaws. Somebody will be used mightily by God, you know, do many things, and then at some point, he will just go south, you know, and I warned him, but and if you look critically, there are character flaws. And why will character flaws cause somebody to, to deviate or to go off track? A couple of points I've been listed. Firstly, when you're not grounded in your character, you begin to prioritize immediate gratification. What does that mean? You will begin to want something to be eating you now, 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 now. Let me take an example. 
you're saving to buy a house. If you and your family, you're saving to buy a house. That's the vision. That's the end point. You saw, okay, if we take two years, each month we save this, 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 I think by this time we'll be able to acquire our house and be more comfortable. That's the vision. That's the goal you want to attain. But then, one day you go out and you see one of your friends with the latest Rolex watch. You're like, I want my own now, now, now. Immediate gratification. Are you going to take all the savings of the house to go and buy a Rolex watch? To also say that I have my own. I'm taking very classical examples, okay? But it goes beyond this. When you begin to overlook the original vision for immediate gratification, that's a character flaw. And it will cause your downfall. Amen? I don't think that someone without a strong character will do is that you will compromise your own principles. You see, you have your principles as a person, as a Christian. You have some lines you say, I will not cross this line. This is how things are supposed to be done. This is how me, I do things. But at some point, those principles are weakened because your character is not strong enough. It's not solid. And once you break your principle, you lose integrity. You lose credibility. And that is very dangerous for a leader. A leader who cannot show himself credible will have no followers. And without followers, you are not a leader. Okay? And the other thing is that when you have bad character, you are very likely not to even work on the bad character. Yes, you leave the weaknesses on dress. You just look at it and, you know, you are not willing to put in the work and the effort to, 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 to address what's wrong. And eventually, it will lead to your downfall. Now, I put an interesting quote there. I heard it about 10 years ago from someone and it, it blessed me. It says, your attitude much more than your aptitude. Tell me your altitude. Okay? How high you go doesn't depend much on your aptitude, your degree, certificates, abilities, competence. A great part of how far you go, of how much you achieve, you achieve depends on your character or your attitude. I've seen people, I mean, I don't know if it happens in Cameroon, but in Europe it's very common. Someone with all the diplomas, competent, well recommended, gone to the best schools, but he does one or two things at work, they say you're fired. I mean, they don't negotiate. It's not like, well, but you're so competent, but your profile is, you're fired. For little things, like, you come late, one week in a row, they're like, we cannot work with you, sorry, you're fired. You're very competent, okay? You have all the diploma, you, I mean, when they interview you, you stood out, it was clear that this is a man for the job. But because of wrong attitude, they will discard you. It's real. Because people are looking for who they can work with, who they can achieve things together. They're not just looking for competence and CVs. That's why it's important you be your character. Now, you don't be a character when you're already in position. Because when you're already in a certain position, other things are choking you. And those things are either coming to test the character you have already built. So don't tell yourself that there will be minister, I will see how to brace up. It's now. So that when you get up there and all the pressures are coming on you, you're untouchable. Amen? Now we'll rapidly give some attributes of godly character which are outlined in the Bible. Okay. We're just going to touch a few. This is really um, non-exhaustive. And most of them can be found in the scriptures listed up there. Those were epistles which Paul wrote to, to his son, Lord Timothy and Titus. And what is peculiar about these epistles is that they are kind of pastoral epistles. Okay? These were people who were in charge of congregations. Paul had established church and had put these people in charge. So he was regularly getting feedback. Hey, Timothy, how is the church in Ephesus doing? How are the people behaving? What is the challenge? And so on. So he was giving kind of leadership, pastoral advice to Timothy about how to run the church. And he said, if somebody wants to be a bishop, you need that some criteria. If somebody has to be a deacon in your church, there's some criteria, there's some things you must assess. Okay? In the past weeks, we have been talking about this, even Saturday meeting. So, I won't overemphasize that. The first thing is, 
be above reproach. That means nothing in your life should give grounds for accusation. Does this mean that you should be perfect? Does it mean that, you know, if some things are in the past, you have disqualified from this point? That's not what it means. It simply means be genuine. Be genuine and be true to yourself and true to others. When you make a mistake, own up. Say, here, I've messed up. I'm sorry. Okay? You know the problem with, 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 with when movies, you know, at times they say, okay, I have a video of you, this is this. You pay somebody money. They cover up. This is, and then, and then, and then. When you begin to cover up, it's a never-ending cycle. And there will be something in your life to bring reproach. There will be something in your life that will bring grounds for accusation. But if you do something and you own up, you say, I did this, I'm sorry. You know. Nothing persists to accuse you. So it doesn't mean you have to live a kind of life and then once you falter, you're disqualified. No. But it simply means let, it, let there be nothing pending, you know, just hanging in the air and your heart is beating that the day someone will discover this one and finish. Okay? Godly character requires you to man up. The Bible says in Proverbs that he who conceals or hides his faults or his sins will not prosper. Okay? But he who reveals them obtains what? Deliverance. Conversion says salvation. Okay? Let there be nothing, let there be no skeletons hidden somewhere. That's integrity. That's being genuine. Secondly, interpret, self-control, respectable. You see, all these things are not just for the church context. Imagine you're in a big board meeting and somebody says, no, I agree. You say, no, no, no. It's not true. I disagree. You can't do that. Everybody look at you and you're like, are you t- if you don't agree, I mean, exit train. You know, do you know the high, the, the way even you can react to somebody and he enters him? It's not about eh, when the person has finished, you dismantle all his arguments calmly. But, but so you said this, this, this. Um, I'm really surprised to hear this because tak, 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 tak. When you finish talking, the person is even looking for where to hide. As he says, restrain. It's not power, it's not force. Hmm? Have you ever seen? A president fighting because somebody has said something that is angry. You don't need you don't need to fight. It says you should when you go back now to your office. You just sign one decree that that guy is so to <laughs> That's it. You, you don't need to eh, what are you saying? Do you know why? That's not leadership. You believe in yourself. Amen. Another criteria that is listed in those scriptures, in those verses, is being hospitable. That is about what? Being approachable. Don't be that as an island. Mm? Island leadership. The man of God, the bishop, surrounded by 12 bodyguards. Nobody can touch him. Nobody can talk to him. When he comes, only to lay hands, and then he's gone. Do you think you're a shepherd leading sheep? You're just an island. Manipulating people. So in your leadership, in your dealing with people, those you're following or your collaborators, be the core person who can, you know, work as a team, who is approachable, who people can work with. Somebody should not be scared to approach you. <laughs> okay? Another interesting point is able to teach. Now, most people think able to teach is about having a gift of transmitting knowledge. But it even begins with being knowledgeable. If you don't know, what will you teach? <laughs> so being able to teach, first of all, about being knowledgeable in our context as changers, as godly ministers, being knowledgeable about, about the word of God, but even out there, knowledgeable about your, your market, your craft, your skill. Don't be in a field and you're ignorant, you're just observing. When somebody does, you say, oh, I how they do it. Okay, let me just be doing it also like that. You should be skilled Develop yourself. Okay? Develop your talent. Develop your skills. Learn to be the best at what you do. Then you'll be able to teach somebody that this thing, this is how it happens. 
One thing about leadership is that people always look up to somebody who has competence. When you reach a situation where it's say blocky, and then you come up, you say, okay, here you have to do this and this and this. That's it. People are looking up to you. That's it. Leadership is influence. People are looking up to you. Without you blowing trumpets and making signs, see me, see me, see me, people start looking up to you. Okay? Next is not a lover of money. <laughs> Interesting one. Let me know if I dwell there. But the bottom line of this, somebody who doesn't love money is simply somebody who trusts God as his source. You love money and your heart is beating like that when it comes to money because you think everything comes from your hustle. If I don't hustle, I'm a dead man. You think it's about your effort and all the calculations you do. That's why you're alive. That's why everything is happening. Do you know about the rich fool in the Bible? Parable of the rich fool in Luke. He had done all the calculations and sat down and said, Oh, my man, you're strong. See your life. You have accumulated money. You have accumulated wealth. All your bands are full. All you can do now is really just relax. Eh? Just, just relax and enjoy life. God said, I'm taking your life this night. <laughs> so, when you trust God as your source, you'll not be, you'll not, you'll, you'll not be trying to divert money and... No. You're going to do what you have to do knowing that God is going to provide. Okay? And one thing that's very recurrent, the next one that's very recurrent in those verses, be it in Timothy or in Titus, is should be a husband of one wife, okay? Should be able to run his home well and things like that. I see it more as being faithful in little things. Those are trivial things. As a man, you have a wife, you have a family, okay? If you can't be faithful in handling those trivial things, how then as a leader, will you be able to handle bigger responsibilities? Be faithful to your marital engagement. Be faithful to your family. That's trivial. That's baseline. I mean, without any position or responsibility, it starts from there. That's a character you must already build. Because as you go ahead, things will get more complicated. Responsibilities will increase. They will give you more and more leadership responsibilities, positions, and so on. And if you have not yet grounded some of these things, <laughs> they're going to bring you trouble. And the last point for now, as I said, it's not exhaustive. There are many more points when you read those scriptures. Holding fast to sound doctrine. This simply means somebody who knows his focus and does not change from his line of thought. You don't seek to manipulate people depending on how things are going. Be it in ministry, in the secular world, you know. At times I love when I see some of these politicians. Somebody that two years ago, he was on all the TV channels. Ah, ah, the ruling party is this. They are crazy. They don't come and slap you one post. I mean, it's like overnight, you start praising, you start saying, no, this is, everything is very fine. These people are the best people in the world. And so on. No. You're not crazy, but you're not integral. I mean, you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't change your line of thought, you change your doctrine to suit some circumstances. A good leader knows his focus, he has his principles, he lives by them, Come rain, come shine. He is stable. Today he will not say that, um, 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 God, you know, as a Christian, homosexuality is wrong. Uh, and then tomorrow, maybe some guys will come and give him some dollars and say, okay, just, just, just you know, just say that it's, it's, it can happen. You know, some people are born like that. Just, just say something about it and begin to change your speech. No, you need to stand your grounds. Like we said during the prayer meeting, pressures will come. Maybe they have already even come for some people and they will keep coming. Hmm? It's up to you now to, 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 to build a solid foundation of character to resist them. Amen. 
to build character passes through self-discipline. Okay. Here's a very short summary of a summarized summary. I mean, the entire book and course is about self-discipline. And I'll spare you that, but I, w- I just wanted to share the key principles. John Maxwell usually says that if you cannot lead yourself, they are not fit to lead. And one sign about leading yourself is applying self-discipline in your life. If you're unable to lead yourself, they want you want to lead other people. So the main principles which I can summarize because for the sake of time and the format of the training are just these three when it comes to achieving self-discipline. One, build your convictions. You won't do something, you know, do or die. You won't give yourself wholly to something you're not totally convinced about. I mean, when you read church history, and you read how some of those people were tortured and killed and you're like, but what would make somebody to just hang on this damn year like a I am serving Jesus? If you care, you cut my head. You hear some place that some people, if you check, in church history, they'll put your hand like that. Denounce Jesus. They'll put one finger. You say no. Denounce Jesus. You say no. They'll put another finger. Denounce Jesus. I'm like, what would cause somebody to. It's begins to, if you don't have a conviction on the inside, I show me lying. You say, it's okay. It is okay. Yeah. Who is yourself? <laughs> Think about it. Think about Jesus himself. Imagine they are putting him on the cross. They have been beating him. He has been tying it. I want to put the first name. God, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I am not the Messiah. It's okay. <laughs> Just imagine. It takes, first of all, a deep conviction. Even the Bible says it in Romans 14, 23, that anything I don't know how the conviction is what? Sin. So don't just do things for doing sake. For a baby, as a baby, you can start doing things for doing sake. But in the course of time, you should acquire a conviction about what you're doing. In our context, look at the different subjects in the Bible. And look at God's perspective about them. Everything is in the word of God. Everything. From accounting to, 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 to politics. To everything is there. You can get the principles for everything there. What does God say about this thing, this issue? What is God's mind about bribery and corruption? When you now get God's mind, it becomes a conviction. And when you are now faced with bribery and corruption, you know your conviction. And you can stand by it. But if you don't have any strong conviction, whatever comes, you just be like a toast to and fro by every wind. That's why it's important you go for the word. There's everything in the word. I don't care your field. I don't care your domain. Everything is there. And nowadays, things have been made easy. There are Bible softwares. There's Google. Just a Bible corruption in the Bible. Google. You will see things. You will see Bible references. There are all kinds of things. Concordances to help you study. Get sound convictions about the things you face every day. Because if you don't have biblical convictions, some other convictions will come and replace them. Which are not sound, of course, and which will not glorify God. So it starts from there. Discover God's principles, meditate on them, and set your mind to live and die for this principle. You are like, hey, this is where I stand. Go up. What does God say about sexuality outside marriage? There are people, I've spoken to some people that are convinced that means for them it's not not to prepare a position fish trap of day. It's not like they're trying to they have been groomed like they know that that is how it is. Those are their own principles. For example, you need to have your own biblical principles to counteract all those other things that are becoming because there's a lot of junk out there. 
And if you're not careful, they will get to you. Amen? And I can tell you, <laughs> scan through the world of politics. Just politics. I'm not even entering business and other things. Around the world, presidents and men of statesmen and so on. And look at how many had sexual scandals. Because they could not stick to these principles, for example, of sexuality outside. They are married and then they have other things outside and then one photographer will come and make dark and then it's the newspaper tomorrow. Scandals. Big presidents. Go and check. Even the U.S. People that, you know, when you read their biography, like, this man achieved this, achieved that. But then on that, they will say, but he had this issue. <laughs> Principles. They do not have them. They did not build the right convictions. The next thing is, once you discover that this is what God says about this thing, be consistent about it. Not a one thing. It's not a one time reading. Okay, this one was okay. I've heard. They, they, you meditate on it. You meditate on it. You think about it. You ponder on it. You make it part and parcel of you. And as Christians, the Holy Spirit is there to help us. To help you assimilate those things. To help you become those things. I was reading one of John Maxwell's comments just this morning and he was like, to build convictions, it takes about six months to one year in his estimation. To, that means his own experience to build a conviction about something. It takes him about six months to one year. He think about it, ponder on it until it becomes part of him. There's no more doubt. There's no more gray area. He knows it is black or white. It is clear. Amen? And one thing to help you also in that is the entourage, the environment you put yourself in. The environment you put yourself in, the people you are working with. Who do you respond to? You need people to help in this journey because at one point you may feel tired, at one point you may feel distracted. There should be people to push you back. If you're already drifting, they push you back. That, no, no, no. This is how it is. And I thank God for watching us because this is really a forum that has helped me. I mean, <laughs> you come to university, there are so many options. Eh? There are so many options. There are so many crews. But thank God, he led me to a platform where, I mean, people could, they want to go like, they hit your head a bit. Like, you know? You're hot and your staff comfort me. God send his staff to your hands. Slap you. Get back in line. Get back in line. And it's for your own good. Amen? Now, that was a very speed lesson. We're going to conclude and do a short exercise. Okay? In summary, what I can say is, one, character is what sustains your leadership. I'm talking about godly, godly leadership here. Without character, it won't hold water. As a common disorder. You'll be making noise, people will be there listening to you. But without character, your influence will depreciate over time. And one thing you should note is that followers look for character in their leaders. Did you know that? Do you think we just follow anybody because they say that is the leader? If you want to be a leader, know that followers are scanning you. They scan, they scan this man. Mm. They look for character because they want someone in whom they can trust, they want someone. They can emulate. They want someone they can follow. Not a do what I say, but they want a do what I do kind of leader. So they themselves are looking. That's why it's important to develop your character properly. And develop all those godly attributes. Okay? And here he says, pay the price to lead with a difference. It won't happen automatically. You must make a choice. I don't just want to be you know, a positional leader. I'm put in position here and I just do my thing. If you want to live with a difference, you need to switch to godly leadership. Jesus said, the Pharisees, the laws of the Pharisees, you know, they lord it over them. They, 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 lord it means, you know, they kind of have control over their followers. But it is not so with you. I, I came to serve. And the greatest of you, someone, one of you wants to be great, he has to be a servant to the others. 
he said that when I was about to, to, to wash their feet and so on, and he was he himself was emulating how serving is a way up. When we read Philippians 2, the Bible says that Jesus did not consider equality with God as something to hang on. But he gave up all of that, became man. And because he lowered himself to man, what happened? He was given a name above. So the way up is actually down. To be willing to pay the price. Don't just be looking up, 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 up. By serving, you go up. Right? Now, are there, are there any questions or comments before I go to the, to the exercise? The last point is an exercise. I'm going to explain it. We have five minutes just to discuss so that we'll have a 15 minutes exercise. I'm not going to have anything to say. I respect you. Okay. No question. So either I've thought very well or people have not understood anything. Hey. <laughs> anyway, let's then rush to the exercise so that we'll have some time at the end for other comments. Um, like we said, it begins with what? Having convictions, right? Based on some core biblical principles. So what I want us to do now, right now, is not an assignment to go and do in the house. Right now, list some core principles that you have as an individual. List some core principles. I don't know. It could be punctuality. It could be... Uh, I don't know. Least core principle that when you know when you look at yourself, like this is how me function. This is how I do things. And then evaluate your discipline in sticking to them. You could make a table. On one side, you say, "Okay, this is one of my principles. How well I'm observing. What is my degree of discipline observing this?" And in you thinking about how well you're observing this, you eventually see the weaknesses. You eventually see what is causing you at times not to fully align with that principle that you, have, that you have chosen for yourself. And you should note it down and start seeing how to address it. Is the exercise clear? For example, I can see my co- one of my corporate space punctuality. I like to be punctual, for example. How well am I adhering to it? You look, you know, just check. You are Wednesday since Monday. You have been late to how many meetings or to how many appointment, whatever, to work, to school, to watch in jazz. And you look at it, you're like, okay, what is causing this? I wake up late, so the puppet is sleep. I have my TV programs, I cannot leave without finishing it. I have, you know, list it out, and then you begin to address, you begin to take dispositions now to address those limiting factors. So we have about 10 to 15 minutes to do that, and we're going to round up. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, the second one. The second one. Principles, yeah. Yes. The second, the second one. Okay. And as we spoke, principles are last, and that will bring results. Are Bible-based principles. Okay. So you can list them down and. Ah. Of. Yes. Yes. Your principles are your convictions. Your principles. Yes. List it that this is. I believe in this. Mr. Block, I say, negotiate.
from here. You can list one and say that this one you need. This other one is a block assay niveau, and then you see how to address it. Does it make sense? Is it going? People are looking at me. I thought I thought you were writing. People are doing copy work. People are sharing principles. So copy work up to the Put and look for a second one. Five more minutes. And I want you to consider you're not just doing it for the lesson. These are things that you go home and look at them. Try to make amends. I mean, I mean you think, you pray about it, you take the necessary steps. It's not just for now in these five minutes that you want to please me. Do an introspection into yourself. Amen. We pray at the beginning and we believe God that this, this session is going to benefit also. Don't take it lightly. I believe this is one way God can really set things back on course for you to accomplish your destiny. So take it serious. Be sincere with yourself. Many years back, the Tonga Kati on something, thought on something. Uh, I don't know you remember. No pain, no gain. <laughs> you get that vibe for like one month, so. <laughs> no pain, no gain. You have to work. You want to see results, you have to put in the efforts. I think we're still in the garage that time. Yeah. God is faithful, yeah. One more minute. Or some people need more time. Those, those writing iPhones will also have eye solutions. Those writing Android will have Android solution. <laughs> no, book is, is the real one. Old school. Old school. God himself said, write on tablets. <laughs> yeah, tablets not have memory cards. Okay. I think we can
pause for now. You can keep writing in the house, okay? But it's an interesting exercise. I do it often. You know, at times as you, you sit back and it's okay. How is my life going? You do an evaluation. I'm lacking here. This one, this one, this one. Okay? It's important. Anybody who's going somewhere always checks his calls. Am I still am I still on track? Am I deviating? Amen. So I encourage you when you go home, complete the exercise. A tête reposée. Sit down. Think over it. Ponder over it. And take tangible steps that are necessary. Okay, maybe I'll ask one or two people to just give one. Maybe one they think the one to share, willing to share. Maybe one principle, one conviction, and what they commented on it. One or two people. Okay. Dr. Mrs. Atta. There's another hand here. Okay, and Joanne. So we'll hear from them and then we'll conclude. Okay, I have a number of them. I'm going to choose this one which is what okay. I'm so much on at the present moment. Okay, I'm um, choosing punctuality. I'm choosing punctuality and some of my limitations is um, and which I the solution I've come up with I think that if I could have maybe a clock, a world clock that I constantly get to look at it and time myself it will help me to be able to better program to go for my programs early and then the other, because most of the times when you want to do, when you program that you're going to do like this, sometimes the children come in and interrupt and you find yourself doing more than, taking more time than you expected to do so. So if I could have a clock at some point, I, I can be able to say that, no, stop. This is, what, this is how far I will stay with you and you know, <laughs> to something else. I know we know Asanda one. Send him to the grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then some other times is the fact that you're really exhausted to, to to give in that full push to be able to catch up with time. Like you you you're feeling so exhausted that you cannot do the things you have you, you intend to do within the given time you have given yourself. So you're really feeling exhausted. And that's one of the limitations too. That maybe some other person will help me with the solution for me. <laughs> well, it's true the human body we are not robot. Are you true? Yeah, and then the last day is preparing yes. the kids. The kids for, for programs mm -hmm. before we come. Because most of the times when you program that you that you finish with an within thirty minutes, sometimes you end up seeing going beyond time because when you're preparing he's rushing the other way you have to run go and catch him so he ends up wasting so much time so those are the three limitations i can think of amen she's bringing a dynamics of children that i can only imagine <laughs> you know for, for others it may be simpler to plan when you don't have that variable um Thank you so much. Thank you for, for sharing. And, and like she said, it's really about planning. If maybe you have, a, if she mentioned a clock, having a clock to know that, okay, this, this is how we do from this time to this time and so on. And even the exhaustion, to an extent, not always, but to an extent, it can be planned. Okay, when you look at how, when you look at maybe a day is unfolding, you know that, okay, this day is going to be like this, that I will need to rest like this, I will need to. To an extent, but of course, there are some days that you know we can't do much about it. Yes, Joanne. Um, at the same time, uh, <laughs> it's like a public commitment to intentionally work on it, and as a reminder that I don't keep it to myself, but I have witnesses. I know. 
one of the things that has been my personal mantra and my core value is to respect other people's opinion and give them room to be the best version of themselves, of themselves, kind of. And in the evaluation of the weaknesses, <laughs> the respecting other people's opinion. <laughs> Are you a victim? <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on, right on. Yeah, he has not been the best. So, <laughs> so one of the things I um I plan on doing or on reminding myself on is to listen, be intentional about listening to other people without trying to necessarily find an answer why the person is still talking, but intentionally listen to the end before proposing a solution if at all you have one or just shut, shut up and just listen. Uh, another thing was to try the other person's solution or proposal or option. Even if you think it will fail, try it to the end then when it feels like, okay, not to say I told you but at least now bring your own out after you've tried the other person's um, option and uh, lastly do not impose yeah I think as I said I'm taking it publicly to to have witnesses so that if it is coming up when it will come up again I kind of <laughs> if okay <laughs> if it comes up again I kind of have a reminder from other people that are close to me or even from myself Okay. okay, thank you. It's a serious matter. Eh? Serious. Hey, the public, en public engagement. So that she can even escape. <laughs> Amen. Okay, thank you for sharing um, the art of listening. Don't bother. If you were a man getting married to a woman, you must learn the art of listening. It's part of the marriage counseling. <laughs> Why you say where now? You must listen. Just just sit down and listen. Yes. Listen very passionately. <laughs> Even if you don't make it say, just be listening. Just <laughs> Amen. Anyway, that's an aside. Okay. I think I'm going to end here for now. Um, but as I said, please go home, continue the exercise, do it regularly, do it often. And, and, and why not share with people like Joanie, share with your leaders, like maybe here she shared publicly, but you could share with someone, an accountability partner to really keep improving, you know, your character and your leadership over time. I mean, I would call Dr. Ngaka maybe to give a few closing remarks, some comments on the subject and to probably pray for us also to close the session. Amen. Thank you very much, Dr. Siwe, for this lesson, which fits in as a square peg in a square hole in terms of timing. I think it's a very timely teaching, and I really appreciate God, and thank you for that. Um, I really wouldn't like to talk much, but a few things I'll talk about. The first, I'd like to comment a little bit on our sister's point. And to say, the first thing I'll say is that one sign of godliness is being able to express your challenge in public in, without seeking to hide anything. It's, it's a sign of maturity. Can't you be on court to the Diablo M. Sire? One bold way to live right, to live fully, is being able to talk. Okay? You don't have any you don't have to impress anybody because what you are talking about, if they care, they look, they despise you. But the God you are serving will seize your heart knows that thing. 
You are hiding from them, but it's exposed before God. And God wants you to be able to handle that. So let man despise you and let you handle what you need to be handled and and make the progress you need to make in life. That's the first foundation I want to make. I mean, I'll extract this from my teaching on Saturday and say this here. One way to godly living is being able, is being accountable to one another. The Bible says, confess your sins to one another. The devil likes when we hide things, when you don't talk about anything to anybody. Why? Because he uses that thing which you've made and it becomes a vicious cycle. And you are doing the same thing in hiding and over and over and over and over. But when you are able to stand and talk about what he did which was wrong, and that you are working, he doesn't want to catch you there because you, you brought that thing to light. He doesn't want to attack you there because he knows that you bring him to light. And it helps you in accountability. It helps you in accountability. So it's important. Feel free and let to be able to share with people. Don't live a life where everything is enclosed. Once you do that, you give the devil a nurturing ground to destroy your life. If you have particular challenges, open up and share them. It's very important. That's an outside. I would say that feeling of exhaustion sometimes means two things. Either maybe we have reduced resistance or we have put too much to do. There are two possibilities. When you work and you feel exhausted, there are two things. Either your resistance is less or you've put in so much than you should handle. What the things that we should do to improve our resistance, it's physical, it's exercise. I encourage us all, it's biblical. Physical exercise profits a little. Okay, we were here thinking there are some, de- there are some decisions I've taken as a person. So I also improve my resistance. And that's physical exercise. And you'll see some of them not long from now. Okay, so it's important. One, it helps you build your resistance. Two, in certain goals, do not set so much to do that you're unable to do. As much as you put a reasonable quantity, a set a reasonable target, that once you do it, it becomes a motivation for you to do more. If you put it so big and you are not able to do it so many times, you can get discouraged and feel that certain goals and objectives are not attainable and you just abandon. But when you set things that you can do, it becomes a motivation for you to do and you are increasing and you are growing. And it's a biblical principle. For he who has more, more will be given. That's the principle of growth. You start from little and you are growing in everything you do over time. So I think it's biblical, and that's, those are the two aspects I would like to address concerning that. I've, okay, I think I like and I appreciate the point about, um, about being intentional, about listening, I mean, about uh, get, getting other people's opinion. I think it's, ve- it's a very good, okay? Give you exercises that you will listen to somebody and say you have nothing to say, and so you just have to pray for him. Okay, it's Give yourself that exercise. The, ten, the, 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 the challenge with, okay, I face that challenge too, where you always have an answer to give. Okay, you, you become too intellectual. And sometimes you are not even allowing the Holy Spirit move through you. You are just, you, you are too V down to that. You are just turning. Or I come to a point where you learn about, I mean, it's good to say what you want to say, but you can you say, thank you, I've heard about it. it looks good. I mean, I would have loved to, but give me time to pray. I just want to pray about it. All right? That helps you. And then two, it trains you. Say, but I learned. Let me ask the opinion of this person. I mean, it, looks, it trains you to, it, I mean, because by extension, it has, it's a good quality to have answers to give to, but one way to help you, bring you to a point where you don't feel, I'm not saying that it is the case, but I'm just drawing our attention. And you don't feel that you're all knowing. It has happened to me. You don't feel you're all knowing that you, you see something good. You can be quick. You might have an answer. 
But you just choose to exercise restraint. After you've learned, learned to listen to somebody till the end, you can choose something where you don't have anything to say. You just say, okay, permit me pray about it. I might also ask the opinion of my leader. But it helps you put you under check. It helps you not to feel in yourself somehow, sometimes, that because you always have something to say, you are all knowing. All right? And the other set up, when you do that attitude, is that you don't become what they call in the world intolerance, which is stupidity and rampage. There is, in, in what we are working on, there is an extreme of it which, is, which, the, which, which the devil has stolen the world to accuse Christians for being intolerant. That we have to tolerate homosexuality and even bad quality, bad character in the name of tolerance. All right? So in, as we work on tolerance, make sure you don't move into that other. So you put your guard on both sides. That you are able to accept and remain. Let the Bible be your conviction. Let your thoughts and everything remain within the confines of the word. Okay? That if somebody does wrong, you should feel free to rebuke him. I mean, I tell you, if you pass me, I will teach you how. All right? But after I've rebuked you, I should ask myself the question, am I rebuking you to help you? Or am I rebuking you to show you that I know? Okay? What's my purpose for rebuking you? I want you to tell me that I know more than you. Or in my sincerest of heart, I want you to be better. Alright? In the name of Jesus. We have a lot to share. Father, we thank you for these words. Thank you for what we've learned this evening. We are transformed in our inner mind in Jesus' name. We are men that live holy. We are men that glorify Jesus in all we say and in all we do. The Bible says your strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. We have shared values. We've shared strengths this evening. We trust you for your power will be made manifest. Enabling us to soar beyond such challenges and to live lives that give you glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for we are the light in everywhere we go. We are the light our job site. We are light in our families. Light in our, in, in our quarters. Light everywhere in the mighty name of Jesus. As we go back home, Lord, angels accompany us in all we do. Grant us success and victories. Thank you for your son whom you used to share your word this evening. May you continue to inspire him, continue to teach him O oh Lord, and use him mightily to be a blessing to your people and to the world at large. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.